Turn to Revelation 12. As uh, we come into this chapter, it's one of the more important chapters, I think, in the book of Revelation. It's knowing and understanding the significance of this chapter that we find clarity concerning the past, present, and future events concerning Jesus, concerning Israel, concerning Satan and his future. Chapter 12 gives us some very important information about God's plan for the ages, specifically in his dealings with the Jewish people during the final three and a half years of the seven-year Great Tribulation. Uh, we left off looking at chapter 11, and we saw these two powerful witnesses being put to death by the Antichrist in chapter 11. We saw that their ministry in Jerusalem lasted for 1,260 days, which is the first three and a half years of the seven-year Tribulation period. They will be calling people in Israel to repentance, They'll be telling the Jews who are bringing their sacrifices to the rebuilt temple that the Antichrist will allow the Jews to build. Uh, he's, they're going to be shouting out, you know, Jesus is the final sacrifice. Your, you know, lambs, your bulls, your goats that you're sacrificing are meaningless because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Those animals will never take away your sins. And so we're told at the end of their Three and a half year ministry, 1,260 days. When that's finished, then the Antichrist, as we saw, puts them to death there in Jerusalem. Their bodies will lie in the streets for three and a half days. And then, as the whole world sees them, again, that's a veiled prophecy because the whole world is watching that event take place in Israel. Oh, it could only happen in our lifetime where you can see a live event in any place in the world at any given time. So the whole world is watching this. They're sending gifts to one another. They're celebrating the death of, I believe, Moses and Elijah. And we know one is Elijah for sure, but Moses represents the law. Elijah to the prophets. They're killed. They're lying there for three and a half days. Everybody's celebrating. And then it says the breath of God comes into them and they rise up and all the world can see them as they ascend up into heaven. So right after they're put to death, the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple and he says, Worship me, I am God. That's the abomination of desolation. And Jesus says when the Jews see that, they're to flee. They're to get out of Israel, get out of Jerusalem, run, escape as fast as you can, because that is when the Antichrist, who is going to be completely possessed by Satan, is going to try and annihilate the Jews. He's always wanted to annihilate the Jewish people. And yet, as you know, God will not allow that horrible thing to happen. God's covenant with his chosen people, the Jews, is an unconditional covenant. So don't ever think that God's done with the Jews. He's not. He still has a plan and purpose for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people. And so in chapter 12, the Apostle John has given this amazing behind-the-scenes look into the past, present and future dealings with the Jews and the ever-present spiritual warfare that they have faced ever since God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans and God created the nation of Israel from Abraham. But the bottom line that we'll see here is God loves the Jewish people, even though for the most part they have rejected him but on the other hand, Satan hates the Jewish people because Satan knew that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, would be born through the Jewish people. Salvation is of the Jews, we're told. And as a result, Satan has done all that he can to try to eliminate the Jews before the Messiah could be born. This is when you go all the way back in history. Woo! -hoo! Go all the way back in history, you'll see that they tried to uh, that the enemy tries to annihilate them very, very unsuccessfully, but he knows if I could stop the Messiah from being born, then Satan would stay the god of this world, and he would remain in control. But, you know, he has Jesus put to death, and he thinks he's got the victory once Jesus died on the cross. But unbeknownst to Satan, the greatest victory was found at the cross when he shed his blood for our sins, and then took Satan by surprise, he rose from the grave, and because he paid the price in full, now we can come into salvation through Jesus Christ. But the resurrection really messed up Satan's plans. 
But that has not stopped Satan from trying to eliminate the Jewish people because he knows if I can you know, eliminate the Jews, then I could eliminate God's word and his promises, that everlasting covenant with the Jewish people and Israel into the millennial reign of Christ. So that's why he's still trying to come against the, the Jewish people. But God will not allow it, as we'll see here in Revelation 12. God has guaranteed in his word that the day will soon come that every single Jewish person who is alive on planet earth at the second coming of Christ will receive Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah. They'll recognize he is the one. When you read Zechariah 12, verse 10, you understand that they will mourn for him as a mother mourns for her only son. They'll ask him, where did you get these wounds in your hands? He says, in the house of my friends. But they will all turn to Christ at his second coming. The Apostle Paul reiterates this uh, guarantee of God's covenant in Romans 11. Look at these verses, starting in verse 25. Paul says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, speaking to us Gentiles, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The Deliverer, that's Jesus, will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, another name for Israel, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so that's a quick synopsis of what we're going to be looking at here in Revelation 12. We'll only get about halfway through this chapter this morning, so uh, important things to look at. So, chapter 12, if you get your Bibles open, look at verse 1. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So notice, first of all, this is called a great sign. There's numerous signs that are called great signs from this chapter on forward. And the Greek is mega semion, which simply means a great symbol that's pointing to something else. It simply means that this is the first great sign that John is describing for us. And we see this in the first six verses here, what this great sign is. And the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, who is this woman? If you don't have a proper interpretation of who this woman is, then the rest of the book of Revelation will make no sense to you or to anyone. So we have to have a right understanding of who this is. So first of all, let me tell you who she is not. I came out of a cult, Christian science, that believes that Mary Baker Eddy is this woman. <laughs> and that the child she has is the truth of Christian science, which is nothing but a big fat lie from Satan. There have been many cults started by women, and most of them believe this woman is whatever that woman is that started that cult is, and then they were bringing forth this truth, this baby truth that comes onto the scene. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Um, that's the most arrogant thing you could think of, that this person who started our church, our religion, our organization, is mentioned here in Revelation 12. There's another interpretation that's a little more reasonable, but it's still untrue in that this woman, they believe, is the Mother Mary. Catholics believe this. Many mainline churches will believe this is Mary, and she'll bring forth the child, who is Jesus, but it's not Mary, as we'll see here in a moment, because it doesn't fit the context of what happens with this woman when she is told to flee, and uh, how God will protect her for three and a half years. Others say this woman represents the church. The obvious problem with that interpretation is the church did not bring birth to Jesus. Jesus brought to birth, you might say, the church on the day of Pentecost. It's often been said that the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. And the only place we find a description of this woman with the 12 stars and you know the, uh, the moon under her feet, the sun, the garland of 12 stars, the only place this is seen in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 37. This is one of the dreams that Joseph had. Remember when Joseph had his dream and he tells his brother that 
I saw this vision, this dream, and in this dream I saw the sun, the moon, and 11 stars, and you all bowed down to me. Well, the 11 brothers knew that he's speaking of himself. We're not going to bow down to you, little brother. And as you know, he was taken uh, by his brothers, thrown in the pit, sold into slavery to Egypt. But the Lord caused it all to you know, work together for good. He raises Joseph up to be second in command over all of Egypt, just under Pharaoh. And there's that seven-year famine. And Joseph, because of the wisdom God gave him, provided. And so... Eventually, because of the famine in Israel, the promised land, Jacob and his sons, they all come before Joseph and his 11 brothers bow down to him, fulfilling that dream. So that's the only place we see this mentioned, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. So this is a reference to Israel. That's who the ones who bowed down before Joseph, and these are the ones who are now mentioned here. Um, notice at the end of verse 2, it says that she cried out in labor, in pain to give birth. This describes the harshness, the, the oppression the Jewish people were under at the hands of the Roman Empire at this time, but they brought forth Jesus. Jesus says salvation is of the Jews. So Jesus is born through the nation of Israel. He comes through the lineage of Judah. So verse 3, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. So he sees another sign. This is all part of the mega sign, the great sign. Uh, we see from verse 9 that this is none other than Satan himself. He's pictured as a great fiery red dragon. In other words, he's fierce, he's evil, he's destructive. He's also described as having seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems or crowns upon his heads. The Apostle Paul calls Satan the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air. Now, before he fell, Lucifer was a created being. He was in the presence of the Lord. He was one of the great angelic beings there in the presence of God. But he fell because sin entered into him. He got puffed up with pride. He says, I will be those five I wills in, in uh, uh, Isaiah. And so God says, no, you won't. God kicks him out of heaven because he became Lucifer, turns into Satan at that point. But that sin of pride entered into him. And it's obvious throughout the Bible that he is opposed to everything God is. He's opposed to everything God stands for. He's opposed to everyone that God loves. And so this is very clear throughout the scripture. Satan hates you. He hates mankind. We, we also know that he is behind all the world empires that sought to... Um, you know, dominates, lord it over mankind. Satan is behind these world rulers. Satan is behind so much in this world that is destructive. But this description of the seven heads and ten horns, it's mentioned in the book of Daniel as well. It refers to the seven world kingdoms that have existed since Egypt, and then Assyria, then Babylon, then the Greek Empire, then the... Uh, Medo-Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire, then the last days, Daniel sees the revived Roman Empire, he sees it as ten toes, iron mixed with clay. Here he has ten heads, and, and we'll see this in chapter 13, how it all plays out. Notice in verse 4, though, about Satan, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, Pause there for a moment. Notice, first of all, he draws a third of the stars of heaven with him. This is the verse that tells us when Lucifer rebels against God, he takes a third of God's holy angels with him. At the end of verse 9, we see that he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So Satan, how devious, how conniving how deceptive he is to talk a third of the angels who are around the throne of God, worshiping the Lord, to rebel with him against God. I mean, that just blows my mind. 
we would think if you were there in the presence of God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, how in the world would anybody or anything turn away from God? And yet this is how conniving, how deceptive Satan is. He gets a third of the angels to follow him, and those are the demons today. Notice again, he was cast to the earth. His angels were cast out with him. But at the same time, this should sober us up to the fact that Satan is the master liar. He is the master deceiver. He is the master manipulator. The Bible has a lot to say about his ongoing mission, which is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what Jesus says he did. He does. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly, but Satan wants to destroy anything and everything that comes before him. So look at verse 4 again. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth, and the dragon, Satan, stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So just picture this. Israel is about to bring forth the Messiah, Jesus. Satan is standing by ready to devour, destroy Jesus as soon as he is born. The word stood here in verse 4 means the dragon stood before the woman means continually standing before wanting to devour. He, stood, he is continually stood before God's chosen people wanting to devour them. The simple reason is Satan hates this woman, hates her child, because God told Satan in the Garden of Eden that this child would bring him to his end. This child would be his ultimate destruction. This is why there's an ongoing conflict between Satan and the Jewish people and Jesus Christ. Satan knew he must destroy Israel or this child would be born who would destroy him. Where do we get this from? It comes from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Remember, after Adam and Eve sinned, they, they obeyed the enemy. They took of the forbidden fruit. And so the Lord shows up, and he sees what's going on, and he pronounces a curse against the serpent, Satan. And this is part of the curse here in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 15. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He... The, the Messiah shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So a couple of very informative things here that God says to Satan. First of all, God says he will put enmity between them. Enmity means the state of being actively opposed, actively hostile towards someone. That describes Satan. He is actively opposed to God, to his people, the Jewish people. He's actively hostile towards us, the bride of Christ. He's actively involved in this world trying to steal, kill, and destroy. This verse also tells us that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. That's the first hint of the virgin birth in Genesis 3.15. Because the woman does not possess the seed, but rather she has the ovum, which is fertilized by the male seed. And God reveals this to us in Isaiah 7, 14. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Satan knew from way back in the garden that he would either be destroyed by Jesus Christ or he would have to destroy Jesus. But as you know, Satan was, he is no match for Jesus. Jesus is God the Son, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He is co-creator of everything visible and invisible. But Satan is simply a created being. Yes, he is powerful. Yes, he is deceiving. Yes, he has millions of demons working on his behalf. But in spite of all that, Jesus is infinitely more powerful than Satan. And just think, he took a third of the angels with him that are demons, so that leaves two-thirds of God's holy angels. So God's holy angels outnumber the demons two to one. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live in us. We are in Christ. 
So greater is he that's in us, right? 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And as you ladies know who are going through Hebrews, the whole topic of Hebrews is he is greater than. Jesus is greater than anything and everything because he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Now, we know that the primary reason that Jesus willingly allowed himself to be crucified upon the cross was to be the ultimate sacrifice for all of our sins. That's why he had to come from heaven to earth. On the cross, God would pour out upon him all of the wrath, the judgment for sin that we deserve. Jesus hung on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that moment, the Lord is pouring out on him all of his righteous wrath and judgment for sin. We deserve that wrath, that judgment, but Jesus took it in our place. He absorbed the physical, emotional, the spiritual pain that we deserve, but most importantly, Jesus paid the only price for sin that God would accept, and that is his sin, sinless, perfect blood. That's the primary reason why Jesus died. A secondary reason why he died, though, was to defeat Satan, to destroy the works of the devil to render him ineffective in the long term against the bride of Christ. This would fulfill Genesis 3.15, because remember, God says of Jesus, he will crush your head to the serpent. And he did that at the cross. Look at these verses, Hebrews 2, starting in verse 14. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So he removes even the fear of dying. You know, I don't fear death. I mean, death is simply a promotion for a believer. We're going to be in the presence of God forever and ever. Now, I don't look forward to the process of how I might die. You know, I, I, I grew up surfing in San Diego, and I always thought, man, this would be a bummer to get eaten by a shark. That's not something I look forward to. And praise the Lord, I haven't been in the water out there in many years surfing. So, But you never know how you're going to go. But we know when we go, we don't have to fear death because we're going to be in his presence forever and ever. The Apostle John reiterates this in 1 John 3, verse 8. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. And notice, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And so he is powerless against us. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. He's given us the Holy Spirit of God. He's given us his word. We don't have to fall for his lies and his temptations. We still stumble and bumble at times because we listen to his lies. We believe his lies. But no, greater is he that's in us. We can have victory over the enemy. The Apostle Paul builds on this theme as he closes out the book of, uh, book of Romans. Romans 16 verse 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Notice shortly, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, when we read that word shortly, it, again, it doesn't mean it's going to happen right away, but it means that when it happens, it's going to happen in a very quick time. Remember in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, it uses that word shortly. These things will shortly take place. Entekai is the Greek phrase. It means once these things happen, it happens in a fast, relatively short time. Revelation, everything from chapter 4 to chapter 19, happens in a seven-year period, shortly. Satan, at the end of the age, he will be destroyed. And when he is locked into the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and then ultimately in the lake of fire, he will be destroyed. So shortly. Uh, Peter tells us, 2 Peter 3, verse 8, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. In other words, from God's perspective, it's only been a couple of days 
since God gave us these prophecies that promise the rapture of the Lord's church and these astounding events in the book of Revelation, the great tribulation, the second coming of Christ. God's like, yeah, it's only been a couple of days, but I'm coming for you. I'm going to bring you home to be with me in glory. So Satan's destruction, it is promised. Ultimately, after the millennial reign of Christ, we read this in Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, that's the Antichrist and his right-hand man, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hallelujah! You know, forever. They're not going to be part of the scene any longer. We'll be in our resurrection bodies. There'll be no more temptation, no more fears, no more death, no doubts. It's just going to be glorious forever and ever. So the doom of Satan is guaranteed. But here, the Apostle John sees him standing before Israel, the woman, ready to devour her child. And we know that Satan tried to literally destroy Jesus when King Herod sent his soldiers to Bethlehem and he wiped out every child two years old and under. Remember when the wise men show up? It was about a year and a half, two years after the birth of Christ, because they came to the home. You know, the shepherds came to the manger. But then when the wise men show up, they find Jesus, it says, in the home. And then Herod says, oh, when you find him, let me know where he is. I want to worship him too. And then the Lord warned the, the wise men, no, don't go that way, go a different direction. So they leave. So when Herod finds out, he wipes out, he destroys every child there in Bethlehem, two years old and under. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Once again, that's Satan's number one objective. He wants to wipe out human beings because we're created in the image and likeness of God. He is one disgusting being. He is brutal. He has millions of demons working for him. Jesus says this of Satan, He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. That's John 8, 44. There's no truth in him, so don't listen to his lies. Here we see Satan just waiting to kill baby Jesus. By the way, Satan is the one who is behind killing all babies. He was the one behind killing all the babies there in Egypt when Moses was born. Remember Pharaoh tells the midwives, the Egyptian midwives, go and wipe out every child, every boy that's born. And then Moses was spared. Satan's behind that. Satan has wanted to steal, kill, and destroy constantly. He's the one that inspired Herod. He's the one that's inspiring abortion today. Satan is behind the death of every human being. He hates you. He hates the baby that might be in you. That's why he's always telling people, oh, that is just a, a fetus or that is just, you know, tissue. It's not a life. And he lies to people because he steals, kills, and destroys. Don't listen to him. You know, support, you know, pr the pregnancy center. Pray for them. I mean, on the back of that card, you see all those names of all those little babies that were born last 2022 because the women were convinced this is a life in me you know satan wants to destroy it doesn't make any sense why does he hate us so much because every human being is precious to god every human being is created in the image and likeness of god so he's trying to distort that image he's behind the whole transgender thing oh you're not really a boy you're actually a girl and so you go through all this horrible stuff to try to make you into somebody you're not created to be satan is behind it all be that as it may, look at verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. So this is obviously speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm chapter 2 is, is all about the, the Messiah ruling and reigning. Psalm 2.9, there it is on the screen. It says, you shall break them with a rod of iron, this is what the Messiah will do. You shall dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. That's at his second coming. In Revelation 19, 15, it tells us that Jesus himself will rule them with a rod of iron. 
So in this one short verse, verse 5 here, we see John summarizing the birth of Christ, the ascension of Christ, and, all, and also the millennial reign of Christ. And so make no mistake about it, our God wins, Jesus has prevailed, Sa Satan will be defeated. But you know, this is what Bible prophecy is like. I heard it explained many years ago, because in that one verse, you have birth, ascension, a thousand year reign. So you look at a mountain range from a distance. If you're, you know, way east of Denver and you look at the Rocky Mountains, you look at, oh, look at all these peaks. And then you get closer to them and then you realize, oh, some of those peaks are many miles behind that other peak. And then you get up on top of there and you realize, oh, there's a lot of peaks behind that. And that's how Bible prophecy is. From a distance, it all looks like one event. But when you get closer, you realize, no, these are all separated by thousands of years. His, his birth, 2,000 years ago, his ascension after he was crucified, and then him ruling and reigning for a 1,000 years. As I mentioned in the introduction, this has not stopped Satan from trying to eliminate the Jewish people. Throughout their history, Satan has raised up all kinds of evil people to try and wipe out the Jewish nation. You know, uh, God told Abraham when he started the, the Jewish lineage through Abraham, God tells him, it's in Genesis 12, I think it's 31, that um, I will bless those who bless you and your descendants, Abraham, the Jews, and I will curse those who curse you to Abraham and his descendants, the Jews. That is still true today. When you think about how Satan has tried to destroy the Jews, remember in the Old Testament with Haman in the book of Esther, his goal was to annihilate every Jew. He made gallows to kill them. He set a date, this was going to happen, and it came against Haman. He was hung on his own gallows. God is standing up for his people, the Jews. Almost every Muslim country around Israel, I mean, even the Palestinian, so-called Palestinians, in their charter, in their constitution, they all say we will annihilate the Jewish people. That's in all their constitutions, their uh, mandates. We will annihilate them. We want to drive them into the Mediterranean Sea. Adolf Hitler, his final solution was to eliminate all Jewish people. He destroyed six million. When we go to Israel in a couple months, we'll be there in March, we go to Yad Vashem. It's the Holocaust Museum. It is brutal, but it shows you the depth of wickedness of sinful human beings. Adolf Hitler was possessed, I believe. He was like a precursor to the Antichrist, tried to eliminate the Jewish people. There is absolutely no logical reason why there should be anti-Semitism in the world. When you think of the Jewish population today, 15 million Jews in the world today, about 8 million in Israel, two-tenths of 1% of the entire population of planet Earth are Jews. Two-tenths of 1%. And yet, Satan focuses on them to annihilate them. Why? Because they're God's chosen people. God is not finished with them. They still need to come to Jesus for salvation. And we'll see here in a moment that many, many Jews will get saved during this time. But it's just crazy. Why would Satan hate them so much? Because they brought in the Messiah. And today he thinks, if I could wipe out the Jews, I'll make God's covenant that he made with David null and void. Because God has given them an everlasting covenant, and he's not finished with them. It was not a conditional covenant. It was an everlasting covenant with David that, you know, one would sit upon the throne of David forever, ruling over the Jewish people. And so Satan is trying to annihilate them. Well, look at verse 6 here. It tells us again, the child was caught up to God and his, and his throne. Verse 6, then the woman, Israel, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. So now we jump ahead 2,000 years between verses 5 and 6. Jesus ascends into heaven, and here in verse 6, we have the Jews fleeing into the wilderness for 1,260 days. When does that happen? Right after the abomination of desolation. Right after the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple, says, Worship me, I am God, and they are told to flee. Jesus tells the Jews, you need to flee. 
Get out of Jerusalem. Get out of Judea, Israel. Flee to the wilderness. Uh, 2019, we were in Petra. And I think that's where they're, and we'll look at this in greater detail next week, but I think they fly into, fly, escape into Petra. Well, he says to take flight, so we'll see how God does that. But they will go to Petra, probably. But it's for 1,260 days, God will provide for them. This is the final three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. After the seventh trumpet sounded, we saw that there's six bold judgments to come, and, and that's the final three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. This is what Jesus says. This is where this corresponds to Matthew 24, verse 15. Um, he says, Therefore, when you see, speaking to the Jews, this is the Olivet Discourse, Jesus speaking of the Jewish people to them, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And we've looked at this in detail before. That's when he goes, the Antichrist goes in the rebuilt temple, says, worship me, I'm God. That's the abomination that causes desolation spoken of by Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says that he will go into the temple, the Antichrist, and say, worship me, I'm God. He claims to be equal with God. That's the abomination of desolation. When you see that, Jesus tells the Jewish people, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. You sense the urgency in what Jesus is telling them here? Get out of town quick. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight, and we'll see what that means next week, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Again, this is for the Jewish people. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, speaking of the Jews, those days will be shortened. And they are shortened by the second coming of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 9, or Matthew, Revelation 19, starting in verse 11, Jesus returns and it says, The bride of Christ, the armies clothed in fine linen, bright and clean, the righteousness of the saints, that's you and I, will be coming back with him at his second coming. So the urgency for the Jews is to flee Judea, get out of Israel after they see the abomination of desolation, because that is when the Antichrist will go on the offensive, and he will try to annihilate the Jewish people. The good news is one-third of the Jews will escape. The bad news is two-thirds of the Jews will not escape. Am I making those numbers up? No, we're told very clearly. It's in Zechariah chapter 13, starting in verse 8. This is the Lord speaking. It shall come to pass in the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die. But one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. Here's the good news. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. And so what a glorious moment that will be when Jesus returns. And again, we'll look at this in greater detail next time. Every Jew will look to him and they'll see him. And Zechariah 12.10 says, they will mourn for him as a mother mourns for her only son. They'll ask him, where did you get these wounds in your hands? And he says, in the house of my friends. But every Jew at that point, at the second coming of Christ, will receive him as their Lord and Savior. It's going to be amazing. Here's something that we should all be aware of. As this physical battle is going on and the Antichrist is coming against the Jewish people, there's also a spiritual battle taking place. Even as there's a spiritual battle all around us today. Look at verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels, here's Michael the archangel, and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them 
in heaven any longer. So here we see Michael, the archangel, the holy angels of God, battling Satan and the demons. And it's not going to be even close. God wins. Michael will win. And notice it says there they found um, no longer was any place for them in heaven. People are confused by this. Some people wonder, well, how come Satan has access to God? I thought he was kicked out of heaven way back when. He still does have some access to God today. In the book of Job, remember in Job chapter 1, it says, Satan appeared before the Lord, and he brings accusation against Job. And he's telling God, well, Job only follows you because you've blessed him so much. You know, take away the blessings and he'll curse you to your face. So we see that he still had some access. In Zechariah, we see that uh, the angel of the Lord is on one side of Joshua, this high priest. This is when they come from Babylon. They're rebuilding the temple. Satan's on the other side, and Satan's bringing accusations against Joshua. Remember what Jesus said to Peter. Satan is desired to sift you like wheat. You know, but the Lord is going to protect him. He was going to see him through. So Satan still has some kind of access today. But at this point in the book of Revelation, he's, uh, he's cast out once and for all. This will be a great day. Look at verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So Satan gets the boot out of God's presence once and for all. But take note of these titles given to him here. Um, he's called the serpent of old. That's how he appeared to Adam and Eve, right? The slippery serpent comes in and deceives them. He was sly. He was cunning. He was crafty. He's also called the devil. The devil means the accuser, the slanderer. He's called Satan. He's, he's going to trash talk you. He's accusing you day and night before the Father. As believers, we're to be speaking the truth in love to those around us. We, as married couples, we are to be speaking truth and love to our spouses. We're to be building up our spouses. If we start tearing them down, speaking evil things to them, you are cooperating with the enemy. This is part of an ongoing spiritual battle that we're in. We should be speaking words that build up, that exhort, that encourage, that comfort, especially in our homes, with our children, our grandchildren. If we're putting them down, if we're calling them no good, you're not going to make it, you're just a loser, then we're cooperating with the enemy. We need to shut the door on Satan's tactics. Don't let him slip into your house. Don't let him you know, get a foothold there and start planting these seeds of fear, doubt, worry, anxiety, and the rest of it. Again, in verse 10, it says, they heard, Then I heard, John says, a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night, day and night has you know, been cast down. What a wonderful time that will be when Satan gets the boot once and for all. Now, don't give him that foothold. This is what James 4, 7 tells us. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you don't resist him, guess what? He'll stay around. He'll whisper lies to you. He'll try to trip you up. He'll tempt you. He never stops doing those things. Or the demons. Satan's got more important people to worry about than me and most of us in here. But his demons are always going to be there to try to tempt us. But what a glorious day that'll be when the accuser of the brethren is shut up for good. In the meantime, if you're being pulled into discouragement by the accuser and by those who are cooperating with the enemy, the best advice I can give you is stop listening to the lies of the enemy. Stop listening to those people around you that are always putting you down. 
Start listening to the truth of God's word. Start standing upon the promises of God's word because the words of Jesus brings life and liberty, strength and wisdom. Jesus heals broken hearts. He doesn't kick you while you're down. Guess who does? The words of Jesus sets captives free. He doesn't pile heavy burdens upon us. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Satan accuses us, but Jesus defends us. The Apostle John says this in 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, guess what? I do. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you still do. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. In other words, Jesus is standing up on your behalf. He is your defender. Again, listen to the Lord's word. Stop listening to the lies, the false accusations of the enemy. And the best way to hear the voice of Jesus is to get into his word. Find out what he has to say about you. And we have so many amazing promises from the Word of God. I've said it for many years now. The bottom line as it pertains to spiritual warfare is this. It's the lies of Satan versus the truth of God's Word. That's spiritual warfare in a nutshell. Satan's going to bring lies, but you have to stand on the truth. The only way we can do that is to know who we are in Christ. Once you know who you are in Christ, then you can just like, oh, I'm not going to listen to that garbage. God doesn't love you. No, Jesus loves me. How do I know? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. He gave Jesus. I believe in him. He's given me everlasting life. I'm not going to buy into the lies of the enemy. And so you can just dismiss those thoughts. We got so many verses that show us how much God loves us and his victory over Satan. Satan will say, God doesn't love you, he can never use you, you're a loser, you're this, you're that, or whatever else you've heard him say to you over the years, the victory is found when you discover and stand upon the promises of God's word. You believe him because you are a precious son or daughter to God the Father. You belong to him. To say it another way, get to know who you are in Christ. This is what Jesus says to his disciples, including us, John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. What a picture of God's love for us. What a picture of his promise to us. You are safe and secure in the hand of Jesus. And he goes on to say, my father has you in his hand as well. So he has given us grace. He's given us mercy. Um, let me just read verse 11 because we just sang that song. We got to read it. I'll pick up here next week. He says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. We'll go into that in greater detail next week, Lord willing. But in the meantime... You can grow in your faith. How? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You can stand upon the promises of God's word. I'm going to go through some verses here that I encourage you to write down, read over, understand this is who you are in Christ. This is how he sees you. You can look in the mirror and say, I don't see much here. But then you see how God sees you as his beloved child. You see the way God sees you as accepted in the beloved so the first verses they're found in ephesians chapter 1 starting in verse thir uh, 3 ephesians 1 starting in verse 3 he says blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in christ you'll see that phrase throughout ephesians in christ in him this is who you are because you are in him and he is in you so yeah, Jesus lives in us, but we're also in him. These are the promises for us who are in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Long before you did anything good for the Lord, he loved you. He called you. He separated you. 
So as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. So you've been adopted into his family according to the good pleasure of his will. So the good pleasure of Jesus and you're adopted. He wasn't like, oh, Father, I got to take Jeff too? I don't want, no. It was his good pleasure. Yeah, he's part of the family. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us, notice, accepted in the beloved. You're accepted in the beloved, in Christ. He's accepted you. He accepted you just the way you were, but he doesn't leave us just the way you were because he accepted us as sinners, but now we're saints because he is changing us from the inside out. Verse 7, in him, because we're in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. We've been redeemed, purchased through his blood. The forgiveness of sins, that means all your sins are forgiven, according to the riches of his grace. How, how many riches are there of his grace? I, I don't know. Way above what I could count. Which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure. There it is again. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one, all things in Christ, speaking of all of us, we're going to be gathered together at the rapture, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Peter says it's undefiled. It doesn't fade away, that inheritance that's waiting for us in glory. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted. And that's all we could do. He did everything for us. All we could do is put our faith and trust in him. So in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, so you had to respond to that invitation, the good news. In whom also, having believed, we had to put our faith in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So that moment you received Christ as your Lord and Savior, he sealed you into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit of promise has sealed us. Who is, the Holy Spirit is, the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That's a long section, but notice who you are in Christ. This is how much he loves you. A couple more verses real quick. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Many of you are familiar with this. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. This is his thoughts towards you right now. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. He's not up there planning on, oh, how can I mess up Jeff today? You know, what can I do to ruin his life? No, that's the enemy. God says, no, I know the thoughts I have towards you, towards all of us. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And our hope is in him. It's an eternal hope. It's a living hope. It's a blessed hope. Finally, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there it is again, in Christ Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Praise the Lord.